it's Dr. Shannon Shea from Learn ABA with Dr. Shea with your Tuesday practitioner tip of the week. Hit me up in the comments if you can think of a better name. I'm not great at naming things. All right, this week it is five ways to know you are dealing with a sensory function. So I prefer, first of all, to call this category of what now most people refer to as sensory as automatic. It just makes more sense to me. It used to be called automatic. I don't know why it changed. Um, but since the name has changed, I've seen a lot more like mentalistic, less evidence-based things for sensory stuff um, along the lines of sensory diets or whatnot. So anyway, I'm just going to refer to it as automatic from here forward, uh, but they really mean the same thing for the most part. Okay, so how do you know it's sensory? Number one is the behavior happens when the person is alone or across all conditions. So uh, I have a headache right now, for example, and when I have a headache, I do this. Actually, on both sides, it feels very good. I would like to just keep doing this, but it looks weird on video, so I will stop. Um, if I had a headache and you were running a four condition functional assessment on me, you know, um, in the control condition when I could do whatever I wanted and any reinforcers available to me, I'm still gonna be doing this because it feels good. Uh, I'm going to do it in the attention condition, tangible escape, etc. right? Cause like it feels good all of the time. And while my head hurts, there is a strong motivating operation in place for me to keep doing it. Uh, so, that is the fastest, easiest way that we know that something is an automatically maintained behavior. But how do you know they're doing it alone? Because a lot of the time, if you're not doing a four condition analog assessment, the person does it alone in part to conceal it from other people because they don't want the behavior to be interrupted. So if someone does something like uh, head directed self injurious behavior, like punching themselves in the head or slapping or whatever, they have learned that if they do that in front of other people, those people will probably stop them or it might develop an attention function, but we're not going to get into that, right? So they might learn to do their automatically maintained behavior primarily alone so that they can actually finish the behavior and get reinforced. Uh, so if someone is doing something mostly alone, how do you know? If it's something like head slapping, it would be very hard to tell, right? Because there's not going to be like a lump on their head or damage to the hands. Uh, but for other things, it's going to be pretty easy to tell when it's happening alone. So I've had multiple clients with trichotillomania. Um, and for an easy example, like I had one client and he would pull out his eyebrows, right? Um, and no one ever saw this person pulling out his own hairs because he learned pretty fast that if he did in front of people, he'd get like yelled at and told not to do it and whatever. So he would just wait until he was alone and pluck his hairs out. Um, so how do I know it's happening alone? Well, I used the um, self-injury trauma scale that Iwata developed. It's very cool if you Google it, SIT, the SIT scale by Iwata. Um, and you just do permanent product, basically, like he has half an eyebrow. I know it's happening, right? Like we don't see it happening, but I can tell it's happening. Same for like number of wounds, the size of wounds, bruises, lacerations, all of that, look it up but that's a good way to tell. So the number one way is it happens alone or it's gonna happen across all conditions. Doesn't matter what. All right, number two is if you have low frequency, high intensity behaviors, those are often automatically maintained. Not always, but a lot of the time and they're very hard to assess because we don't get that many opportunities to see them happening, right? This is like once or twice a year, someone will engage in like very high intensity, very dangerous behavior. Um, and it's usually a little bit puzzling to everybody. Those are often at least one of the functions is automatic, not always, but in my experience as a practitioner, I have found that frequently those low frequency, high intensity behaviors that we all dread as behavior analysts because they are so hard to assess, tend to be an automatic function or have that as one of the functions. Maybe not the primary, but it's in there. And that leads us kind of into number three of how you know is that it kind of like waxes and wanes without anything else changing in the environment. So um, you might have a behavior that's automatically maintained that won't happen or no one will see it or notice it or whatever for weeks, months. And then for like a two week period, it's happening all the time. And then it kind of just vanishes, right? And I know, I know if you've been a behavior analyst long enough that you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And it's very frustrating. Um, it's not always automatic, but it's often automatic. And the other thing I tell people to look for when you have a behavior that like comes and goes and it's really high intensity and then it just disappears, but nothing in the environment has changed 
nothing in the person's schedule has changed, no med changes, like nothing has changed, but this one behavior keeps changing kind of dramatically and in a sometimes cyclical way is a good sign it's automatic. And a lot of the times that is an underlying medical condition. Um, so I get migraines more often in the springtime. And if I had problem behaviors that were automatically reinforced, they would happen a lot in the spring and then the rest of the year hardly ever. And if I couldn't tell you that what I'm having is a migraine, that'd be very hard to figure out. So it waxing and waning without any other changes, right? Like the environment has stayed entirely the same, but the behavior like goes way up, disappears for a while, comes back, stays for a while, vanishes again. It's a good indicator that's an automatic function. All right, tip number four or clue number four, I guess clue, right? Is that, um, again, in my experience as a practitioner, things that are uh, automatically maintained don't tend to satiate very well, um, or if they do reach a point of sati satiation, uh, it doesn't go very long. So if someone engages in, like, let's say rocking behavior, right? Like I know people that will do this for hours and hours and hours and hours. Or a better example for me is like, I always like run my hands through my hair. Like I keep doing in videos, uh, even though I try not to because it just feels nice and it's kind of like automatic and I do it without thinking about it all the time and it's fine. Um, but it doesn't really satiate. I don't reach a point where I'm like, oh, I've run my hand through my hair enough. I'm good now, right? It's kind of just always ongoing, almost like a habit. Um, and if I do satiate, the satiation will be brief. So that is one way to tell. And my last number five way to tell that there's an automatic function going on, and this one is tricky, but probably one of the most useful ones that you may not find many other places, is that if someone else is involved and you replace them with a literal robot or a machine or got rid of them but got the same thing to happen anyway, uh, would the behavior keep happening kind of as a thought experiment, uh, which I know doesn't make sense, but hang on. So an example would be uh, like if my partner is giving me a massage, right? And he'll be like rubbing my back while we're watching TV or something. And we all do this, I think. I'm guessing you guys do too. Uh, if he like stops massaging for a second, like I'll kind of like lean in and be like, hey, keep going, right? Um, as an ST to him to massage more, right? Uh, if there was a robot that was massaging my back and I could lean into it and it would keep massaging me or something, like that would work just as well. I would not care. I love my partner very much and I like hanging out with him and spending time together. Uh, but for the massage piece specifically, when like my back or my neck hurts, if he got replaced with like a robot that did the exact same thing just as well, I wouldn't care. If I could do it myself as well, I wouldn't care. I just sometimes can't really reach, right? Um, so that's kind of what I mean. Um, an example that would more be like maybe a younger person or someone with an intellectual developmental disability doing this would be some people um, seek deep pressure or uh, they seek out like, and this is an uncommon function, but it does happen sometimes. Like sometimes the uh, function of restraint is that deep pressure, right? They want to be restrained so they can get like that, that pressing feeling. So once in a blue moon, when that happens, if I replaced the people putting the individual in a restraint, right? Like holding them really tight with a robot that held them really tight, would it do the same thing? Yes, because that's what Temple Grandin invented with like her cow squisher relaxer machine. Um, so some people I've, you know, taught them as a replacement behavior just to hug themselves really tight when they're seeking that deep pressure so they don't need other people to like pile onto them. So those are five ways to tell that you have an automatic function afoot. Um, they are not like definite yes or no's just because someone has these things doesn't mean it's definitely an automatic function, but they're definitely clues. So I hope that helped. If you have ideas for more stuff, comment below. And also if you want more of these, don't forget to subscribe and give me a like. Thank you.